Thanks for joining me for a study in Daniel 5 today. So grab your Bible, turn there. Uh, We're going to jump into that. Uh, I'm hanging out in my prayer dungeon. Uh, It's a little hot today, as you know. Uh, Preparing myself a little bit for next week. We're going to look at Daniel in the lion's den. But I love... uh, I love this chapter that's set before us uh, this morning here in Daniel 5. Uh, The party's over for Nebuchadnezzar uh, and his successors. (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah, we see Nebi. uh, We looked at him last week and how God uh, put him down, humbled him. And uh, there are people in power that God has done that to throughout history over and over again. They get full of themselves and pride is ugly. And God loves us too much to allow us to stay the way we are. And once we've been born again in the spirit of God and has given us a new heart that is soft and workable, he works with us. Um, but I love that Nebi walks off the pages of scripture here on a positive note, uh, finished well. And that's really what uh, we're called to do, brothers and sisters, um, finish well. So last time, a few things um, come off the, the lips of the king there. Look at chapter 4, verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. And all those wh- whose works are truth and his ways, justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. So now chapter 5 comes, and this is a 30-year gap in time for us. Um, 23 years have passed since Nebi died. Uh, four leaders have come and gone within this time. Daniel had been there for 70 years, okay, uh, taken from uh, Israel, and he was brought to Babylon as a slave and served there 70 years. And as we consider this time period and all that was going on, let's look at Nebi's family tree for a second. Um, it has a bunch of rotten branches. Um, only after two years, um, there were or two years, uh, there was a evil uh, Mary doc. Um, that reigned, uh, and that was one of Nebuchadnezzar's sons. Um, And then because uh, his brother-in-law then, uh, there was a general, Nira Glizar, um, assassinated him. That's why. And then he reigned for six years, and then this guy died. So Babylon's going through their kings pretty quick here. And then he had a son, Labashai Merduk, uh, who took over, but he only ruled for two months in that time. He was overthrown by Nebuchadnezzar, and he was a son-in-law to King Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, there's a little bit there as we look there, but uh, this Nebuchadnezzar, he spent the most time in his reign uh, away from Babylon, uh, fighting, securing uh, the borders uh, for them, and really strengthening the empire during that time. And he appointed his son, uh, Belshazzar, who was a co-ruler with him during this time, and he was in charge of all that was taking place in the city of Babylon. Now, Belshazzar sat comfortably in the throne of Babylon is uh, (laughs) it hadn't been overthrown in a thousand years. That probably wasn't even on his radar of even being a possibility. So what's set before us in this chapter today? Well, they're thinking that Babylon's impregnable or was it? You know, that's what we get to look. I I love the quote. There's a quote out there that uh, is spoken of when it comes to the Titanic. Even God can't sink this ship and that's just pride um so meanwhile we have the medo persians and there's this king cyrus uh of them and his army they were headed towards babylon now nabadanus uh cuts him off um at this opus on the the tigris river there uh and forced them to withdraw 
in Cyrus, you know, he gets a straight shot then to Babylon. So we have Belshazzar uh, that comes up for us in this chapter. He didn't care. Uh, it had big walls, a big moat, 20 years uh, of food that they had stored up in case something happened. Uh, even during a siege, they're throwing a party. So let's take a look here. Um, Crash's party for a moment and see what's happening. Look at verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and the silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords his wives and his concubines might drink from them. And then they brought out gold vessels and they had some that had been taken from the temple of the house of God that had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood in stone. So Belshazzar, we see here in verse 1, it's not Belteshazzar. Um, and then we see his father, so an ancestor. His uh, This would be Nebuchadnezzar's grand son, okay, not his son. Um, and it's cool because if you actually look into this, there's a lot of archaeological evidence. One of the things I love to have next to my Bible here is uh, Healy's uh, commentary handbook. Okay, um, if you look on page, it's pretty thick. Three forty-four. It actually talks about the foundations that they dug up in Babylon of the very walls. They were all discovered there. Um, so we know exactly when uh, it was when uh, this all took place that we read of in Daniel five, October twelfth, five thirty-nine B.C. If you guys catch there, it said, while he tasted the wine, and that makes me think the foolishness of drinking of wine. Proverbs 31, we mark down verses 4 and 5. And this is uh, wisdom being given to a son, and it says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicate, intoxicating drink. Why? Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. So we are called as Christians, um, royal priesthood guys, um, to be sober-minded. Okay, so it's one of those things. I chose. I choose not to drink. One of those things because God tells me not to as a, a pastor, as an elder, it's not to be given to wine. So... Uh, that's that's one thing I, I personally have a conviction of, but also just as a believer. Man, if I have you, a brother or a sister in Christ, or someone uh, in a crisis gives me a phone call, and, hey, could really use some help, could uh, could really use some counsel, are you able to come over? Uh, sorry, you know, I'm going to drink it tonight. Uh, probably not a good idea. You know, a little, little tipsy, can't drive, sorry. Uh, that would just be a bummer. So anyways, that's between you and the Lord. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, search the scriptures in light of what it says about drinking. Um, they toasted here. Let's consider this. They toasted who? The gods of gold, the gold vessels there in Babylon, right? The head of gold and not with silver. Why? The Medo-Persians, silver. So nothing makes Satan happier. Uh, then when we treat holy things as unholy. Did you guys catch that Belshazzar had uh, things taken out of the treasury there that were of uh, the temple, okay, the utensils, the cups there that were set apart for God? So nothing, um, nothing in this world uh, does Satan want more than to get us off track. Um, and you are holy if you are in Christ Jesus. Uh, and we're called to be holy as he is holy. And if Satan can get us doing 
and being on holy guys uh yeah i think that makes his day so uh verse one i think we can ask ourselves this question what are you toasting to the god of this world i mean be real what are you toasting to that are not eternal things things that are praiseworthy uh that are good <laughs> that are true so drunk with wine, he commits this ultimate blasphemy never attempted by any of the other Babylonian kings before, and it was the, des the desecration of these temple items. So being drunk here, he has no fear of God. Okay, He's a great example of when we talk about fearing God and what it isn't. Okay? Um, he treated the lion of the tribe of Judah like a tamed pussycat. Um, he didn't fear God. He, he toyed with him here. And then if you look at verse 4, the second major issue that uh, King Belshazzar had is idolatry. Okay, That's, that's the second big one. So drinking, um, idolatry. Uh, my head goes some places, you know, not in the way of being judgmental, but um, I live in a smaller city and it's crazy. We have more bars than churches. Um, I think we have more bars per person uh, than any other city in Wisconsin. And we know Wisconsin is one of the most uh, drunk states. Um, I mean, the city I grew up in, just 10 minutes down the road from here, uh, I consider the drunkest city in the or the nation at different times over the last decade. I don't know how they figure that out. It's just probably the amount of alcohol that is sold and consumed. Um, but I think about how often people go to bars around here. It's normally during uh, sports events, you know, and it's nothing wrong with sports. We enjoy sports. It's, it's good fun. But the danger is, is when we begin to worship you know, a player or a team and they become an idol. It's all about them. And if they lose, man, my whole life is, you know, turned upside down. And it's just crazy how much of, you know, enjoying those sports, you know, is around alcohol. A lot of the bars thrive during those times. They have TVs all over to have the games on because that's what's going to draw people in. Anyways, just a thought. Let's look at verses five to nine. Um, in the same, and you guys are going to like, you're going to love this part. This is crazy. In the same hour, the fingers of a man, the fingers, just fingers appeared and wrote, uh, opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the King's palace. And the King saw the part of the hand that wrote, then the King's countenance changed and his Thoughts troubled him so that his joints of his hips, catch this, the joints of his hips, they were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. So he's freaking out. There's a writing going on on the wall. A finger appears. Something's being written here. Uh, his joints are loosed in his hips. You know, I probably pee in his pants, guys. Uh, verse 7, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me that interpretation uh, shall be clothed with purple and have a gold chain around his neck. And he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then Pal Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. So when we read verses five and six here, we read of this writing on the wall. So when was the only other time that we have seen God write with his finger? Of course, that's Jesus when he knelt down and he wrote in the dirt there in John chapter 8, verse 6, I believe. Okay, we don't know exactly what he wrote there, but we know that there were a bunch of onlookers ready to stone an adulterous woman. And he wrote something in the dirt. And then he said to all the accusers, if you're without sin, you can cast a stone. 
And one by one, they began to drop their stones and walk away. It's going to be fun to find out someday what Jesus actually wrote in the dirt. Um, I think maybe it was, you know, their sins, things that they had done, maybe even worse. Um, called them out. Who knows? Don't know for sure. Um, but it probably just spelled doom, whatever it was. Uh, I love verse 6 here uh, in the picture that it paints for you and I. Uh, no one has done this verse better uh, than the old King James. I want to read it for you for a second. Uh, then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that his joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. And you guys know the feeling where... Um, you know, think about when you were the most scared in life. Um, I know as a child, um, going in our basement was a scary thing, especially when it was dark and the lights were off and everything was black and having those thoughts that you have as a kid. I heard something down there and I've been watching Scooby-Doo and the monsters are in the basement and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's that kind of a fear. And maybe for you, it's hey, being on the edge of a cliff and looking over and like, wow, I can't stand being up this high. This is crazy. What if I fall off? Or maybe you've gone to, I took the kids to the wind caves uh, Sonny and I, a couple summers ago, and they took hundred, hundreds of feet down under the earth. Um, talk about an eerie feeling. Um, yeah, anyways, verses 7, uh, 8, 9 here again. Um, God shows that not so wise men is not so wise. <laughs> okay. uh, actually, these guys are completely helpless. And I think it's silly. We look to the wisdom of this world, the really smart guys <laughs> that are out there, um, and they really don't have answers. Um, Belshazzar, we see in verse 9, is even more upset as a result of them not knowing what's going on. So let's talk about the queen bee for a second. Look at verse 10. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen, the queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever, and do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy God, and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, uh, or the king named Belshazzar, now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. I love this scene, guys. Um, seeing Daniel's faithfulness to the end. Um, this queen, okay, it may be Belshazzar's grandmother here, um, Nebi's surviving wife, we don't know for sure, uh, but if it is her, she would have remembered Daniel. Um, and then Daniel is brought forth and has an interview. Look at verse 13 here. Daniel was brought before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, who is one of the captives of Judah, whom my father the king brought out of Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me the interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the things. And I have heard you, that you can give the interpretation and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So Daniel's probably 80 now. 
Um, I got a quote here. Before the sapling king, Daniel stands like an oak tree. His character firmly rooted, his integrity unshakable. And I have been loving the example that Daniel has been for you and I. Uh, what a man of character, of integrity. Uh, and then the judgment day comes. So learn from those who've come before you. Um, Daniel here in verse 17 answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom of majesty, glory, and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened by pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your hearts, although you knew all of this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your Lord, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. In the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all of your ways, you have not glorified. Wow. So Daniel lays out in verse 17 that he can't be bought. I love it. Can you be bought? <laughs> What's your price? Uh, hopefully you treasure Christ above all things in that you know uh, just how much you are loved in the price in which you were bought. Man, God gave his all for you. How can we not do the same? So before he reveals the meaning here, first a lesson from history is given uh, to the king in verses 18 and on. And then uh, it gets personal with Belshazzar. But you, verse 22 and 23 there, so what terrible sin was he guilty of according to verse 23 here? Well, pride, <laughs> blasphemy, idolatry. So you worship lifeless objects instead of the one who holds your life in his hands. And that's a perspective a lot of people just don't think of. They don't want to deal with. Um, People can't hand re handle reality is what it comes down to. So now the hand is about to take everything from you in which you have boasted. So remember, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. So what is the verdict? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Look at verse 20. Five with me here. And this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. So this is the interpretation, verse 26, of each word. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. 
Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes in the Persians. So the literal translation here, guys, uh, mina, mina, a shekel and a half a shekel. Okay. Many um, means to number. Okay. And a mina is worth 50 shekels. So we say today, your number's up. Okay. <laughs> Same thing. So all of our days are numbered, yet we are not to tempt the Lord our God. Uh, so teach us to number our days, right? Uh, isn't that our prayer? Isn't that what Psalm 90 tells us to do? And then tekel, this word, many, many tekel. Uh, it's to weigh, to weigh. Uh, if you want to turn to Job real quick, uh, chapter 31 towards the end there, we're going to look at verses uh, four through eight. Um, I love this passage. It says, doesn't he see everything I do and every step I take? Have I lied to anyone or deceived anyone? Let God weigh on me the scales of justice, for he knows my integrity. If I have strayed from the pathway or if my heart has lusted for or what my eyes have seen, or if I'm guilty of any other sin, then let someone else eat the crops I've planted and let all that I've planted be uprooted. So, back to Daniel. Many, many tekel you farsen. You farsen means to divide or to break um, into two. Uh, Perez, okay, it, it's a single form of euphorcin. So it does us well to frequently weigh ourselves, guys, um, in the scale of God's word. That's why it's so important that we are in the scriptures daily because our thinking can get really messed up real quickly. And there's so many times where I'm in the word and yes, God, you are right. <laughs> I am wrong Okay, how did my thinking get over here? Um, we're told in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, for if we judge ourselves, we would well, we would not be judged. So it is a good thing for you and I to do, saints. Um, so if we put it together, okay, this writing on the wall, the words were in Chaldean, okay, in Babylon, a mina. Um, or a tekel were different weights, okay? And the word Perez simply means to divide. So God gave Daniel the interpretation to this. Numbered, weighed, divided. Belshazzar, your days have been numbered. Your time is up. And it had been weighed in God's scales and it's been found wanting. Now his kingdom would have you know, be taken from him and divided to the Medes and the Persians. So numbered, weighed, divided. Apparently, Daniel here intended a play on words for the change in the vowels of Perez, which gives it Persian or Perez. Um, verse 29, if you look at here, Belshazzar seems to be unmoved by this. I don't get it. Okay. <laughs> uh, the smoke alarms were going off. He could smell the smoke, uh, but the party must go on, right? The party continued. Uh, a proud and a haughty man, we're told in Proverbs uh, 21, 24. Uh, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. Oh, a proud and a haughty man. It's hard. God has asked me to love some people. It really rubbed me the wrong way. And it's hard, guys. You know, I know I'm a prideful person. I ask. I'm trying to learn humility. It's something that we can see taught clearly in Scripture. Uh, God gives grace to the humble. Um, but a lot of people rub me that are very proud. Um, and I think it's because there's pride in my heart. But there's some of the hardest people for me to deal with. Um, it's just that arrogance uh, that people have. And that's not like our Jesus. And I don't know if you guys poured out all of himself, the, the kenosis, okay, emptying of, of God. Like he, yeah, Jesus is still God, but he 
laid that aside to become like you and I so he could serve, sacrifice to die for you and I. That's crazy, but we follow Jesus. We are Christians. We're followers of Jesus. That just gave me a warning. So think on that for a second. The reality of what humility looks like and the cost to it, what it means. And I think there's a reason why we see so much pride today in the world. And it's because we're self-centered. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but every time we consider self in the scriptures, sorry, I gotta go underneath my desk for a minute. That's where this thing is. But every time we see pride brought up in scriptures, I mean, we see the pride in the garden way back in the beginning, right? We had Eve. She was deceived by the serpent. And we have the serpent, Satan. He wanted to be like the most high. That's pride. And that's why he fell. He took a third of the angels with him. And then we have him lying and deceiving Eve in the garden. And she wanted to know things like God knows things and trusted a serpent's words over God's words. Um, and it was a selfish thing. I, I want to I wanna know. Um, pride is selfish. And self always equals sin, guys. Uh, so I want to encourage you. Um, don't be proud. <laughs> don't be a haughty man or woman. Uh, we don't want the name scoffer. Um, yeah, pride is not worn well. So Belshazzar, um, proud, proud, even though the party's over. <laughs> um, the head of gold, right, uh, was about to be decapitated taken off and held under those silver arms of the Medes and the Persians. So is the Lord showing you any warnings lately uh, that have that you haven't been heeding? Okay. Has God been speaking? Um, we need to listen when he does. So how many men have waited to change just a little too long before they woke up one day? They found their wife, their kids, gone. Nowhere to be found. How many women have received one too many uh, flirtations come their way before they found themselves falling in the arms of another man uh, that just gave them that attention that they were craving, wanting? So listen to the different, you know, Daniels here. Um, <laughs> that God places in your life. Um, we need to listen. Um, I pray to be like a Daniel. I know I'm not the smartest or wisest man around, um, but I think when we do seek the Lord, when we are men and women of prayer, Daniel was a man who took God's word seriously. Um, I think there's just going to be unique situations because um, we are prepared and ready that God will put us into other people's lives to speak truth to them, um, to really set them free. Uh, we see the warning signs all around us. Uh, we see how destructive sin is. and The world is looking for answers. They're looking for hope. Um, and we have that. And we get to share that. So uh, I pray that you desire to be a Daniel. Um, and also I pray that we are wise to receive the counsel of the Daniels that God's put into our lives. Um, so men and women here strike a new course. They don't end up shipwrecked. Look for lighthouse warnings. Um, so the unknown king, according to uh, three house, uh, historians, um, Cyrus shows up, diverted the Euphrates, uh, which ran right through the middle of the city. I think that's kind of cool into these new channels and uh, guided by two deserters. They marched by um, 
in the dry bed. Now they were able to go in under the city while the Babylonians were, you know, grousing, feasting, partying uh, to their gods. Uh, so literally the end comes here. Look at verse 30. That very night. How long do we have, guys? That very night. Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So God gave a year to Nebuchadnezzar to repent. Um, but here he judged Belshazzar that very night. Belshazzar was slain that very evening. Never wait to repent, I think is the point, guys. Today is the day of salvation. Man, repent and be saved. It is that simple. Ah, I want to continue to enjoy this season of sin because it's fun right now. I can get right with God later. I still have time. Man, heed the word of God, guys. Repent is so sweet. It's the sweetest word in all the Bible, guys. Repent. There may be times of refreshing that come from being in the presence of the Lord, and there is nothing better as his creation than being before him, knowing him, being in his presence. And the world is looking for peace right now. So much unrest. You look at these riots. Man, if we repent, guys, we'll find that rest. And that rest comes from God. We're looking for answers and solution. It's God. The hope is in Jesus. It is the gospel. It's so simple. Why don't you care? You should be over here with us. Okay? You're a pastor. You're a Christian. Don't you care? Shouldn't you be speaking up about this stuff? Yeah. But I'm not going to move. Upon Christ the solid rock I stand. I'm called to be about his business. He's called me to a ministry of reconciliation. That doesn't change today or tomorrow because of what's happening in the world. And what a start to 2020, huh, guys? Man, we read in history of plagues, pandemics, how it shook the world. We read of the Great Depression or other times where the economy just fell apart. Okay? We look at the injustice that's going on. A man taking another man's life on. I'm like, I'm glad this cop is getting charged. Okay. But the riots, one injustice and more injustice is actually going to be the solution. No, it's not. And so many people, why aren't you angry? Well, I am angry. There's a righteous anger. That's wrong. I'm glad this cop's being charged. But big picture, guys. There's eternity set before us. That's what matters. Men and women are going to go to hell for all time. That stinks. That doesn't, that is what God wants. He's made an out. He has a solution. He is the remedy. And why are we tripping, guys? We're tripping over this injustice. And right now in the United States, we have 3,000 babies that were probably killed today. I mean, if you want to sit and argue about what's wrong, we got men and women killing each other in our streets. What about that? That's wrong. People are dying every day. It's our wickedness is being revealed. Okay. Instead of repenting, okay, people are standing in their rights. And it's gross. It is wrong. It's their idol. And I'm even seeing so many Christians. And we are drawn to conspiracies for some reason. Shame on us when we know the truth, the word of God. We are not to be tossed to and fro, brother and sister. Stand upon the rock. Stand upon God's word. Receive wisdom, direction, truth that will set us free, guys. So we have Belshazzar. Judgments come, right? Slain that very evening. 
Judgment comes when people least expect it. It's kind of like the days of Noah, right? Yeah, whatever, dude, you're nuts. 100 years doing this boat thing. A little crazy. 40 days, 40 nights, nonstop rain floods the entire world. Same thing happened in Lot's time. Luke 17, verses 26 to 32. You can jot that down. Check it out later. I would like to share with you from Luke 11, though. Verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, Jesus said. And he who does not gather with me scatters. So, take a look in the International Standard Encyclopedia. It tells us that about 280, the once mighty Babylon, with all its towering walls, beautiful gardens, completely destroyed. Darius was the first Mede to reign in Babylon till Cyrus took over. Now I want to end with this, guys. Let's never underestimate the impact of one solitary, godly life. Please. Everybody else is great. What is God asking of you? What, to be holy as you are holy? Yeah. To walk with you? Yeah. To be a doer of your word? <laughs> yeah. So let's not under, underestimate. I, I look, I love how God takes ordinary men and women and how he uses them. Man. Think of the disciples, guys. <laughs> they were messed up. You know, think of Mary's seven demons. Man, Jesus chose her to use you. So against any bleak backdrop of judgment stood one reassuring and constant light, Daniel. He endured because he courageously spoke God's truth and he refused to compromise in his character so I want you to ask yourselves, are we, are you, am I doing the same? You may be the only light. You may be the only testimony that your friends, your family, coworker, that someone's ever going to see. So we need to be careful. I'm not trying to throw a trip out there. This is just reality. We need to be careful how we live. You may be the only Bible someone ever reads. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the grace that has found us. Because it is so good and so amazing, we want others to have it also. So we're asking of you today, God, that you'd help us, Lord, to be men and women of character, of integrity. God, because we want to represent you rightly. We want others to come to know you to find this amazing grace also. So we pray that you would open the eyes of those who are blind. God, thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you so much that we can repent at any time. And today is the day of salvation. Help us to be looking to you. And I do want to pray just wisdom for us. A lot shaken out in such a short time right before our eyes. God, help us, Lord, to have wisdom and how to, to respond, to speak to, into what's going on all around us. God, you call us to this ministry of reconciliation. Lord, we know that you are the solution. So please, God, give us wisdom on how to be a light, a preserving agent of yours. In this time, we ask in your name. Amen. Well, thanks so much for hanging out and sticking it in to the end here. 
A uh, great chapter. Next week, you can read ahead, please. Daniel 6, uh, The Lion's Den. A uh, lot, lot of great ins. I don't know about you guys, but I've been loving Daniel. This is a book I often go to. Um, it's just rich. <laughs> it is good. So hopefully we'll see you back here next week. God bless you today. Good.